I have been asked to do a series on the festal service of Lessons and Carols, the first section of which last week rehearsed first that there are three streams that inform our understanding, of one of which is very clear to you. Um, that's the King's College version of the festal service of Lessons and Carols. Everybody knows about it because it's been broadcast every year since 1929 on Christmas Eve, with the sole exception of 1930. During the Second World War, it was broadcast <coughs> by blacking out where the broadcast was coming from. At the same time, because they were so worried that they'd figured out, they took all of the stained glass windows out of King's Chapel, which was nice because they needed to be cleaned anyway. So you know about the first stream or influence, which is the King's Chapel. And I went through it pretty carefully last week and I'll say a few things in a moment just to remind you. Or for those of you who are bold enough to try this for the first time today, I'll tell you what you missed, which the rest of you will say probably wasn't that much, so that's okay. <clears throat> the, um, the second stream is the one that you don't know as well, and that is that in the 1960s, the Episcopal Church got around to the business of deciding that Advent was part of the liturgical calendar. Now, that seems a little odd, doesn't it, that it took them that long to figure it out, but it became officially part of the liturgical calendar in 1966, and then again in 2000, and they set up alternative services. But the important point was that they were striking a distinction between... Um, <clears throat> Advent and Christmas and Epiphany. Those are three separate um, <clears throat> events in the liturgical calendar um, with very different emphases. We can get into that if you'd like. But the principal point was that meant that there was at least in principle a distinction between the festal service, I'm still learning how to walk with a cane, so forgive me. The cane does not b obey me. I, you know, I'm supposed to have the power, you just get up and it jumps into my hand. Um, I've been <clears throat> to Hogwarts and tried this again and again, and my kids laugh and say, no, it's simple, and then they do it, but I can't get the damn cane to come up to my hand. So I may be stumbling around up here for the next hour in any event. By striking that distinction, they made clear something that is not as clear when you listen to the King's College uh, <clears throat> version of the festive service of Lessons and Carols, and that is that they run together the Matthean account and the Lucan account and Isaiah which is all imitative of St. Francis, who in 1223 put together the first crush in Grecio. And when he was doing that, his, his intent was to, um, <clears throat> let me be blunt, entertain the villagers so they'd want to go to church. So, and we still do it because <clears throat> they give everybody a chance to dress up as a cow, you know, or a sheep. Or, or, you know, <clears throat> a donkey. Um, if you're lucky, you get to be a wise man. Uh, I told you last week that my son was a wise man until he told the priest that it was ridiculous that the wise men would travel with gold and frankincense and myrrh across the desert. And they couldn't have traveled the distance in the time allotted in the Bible, and he was demoted quickly to being a sheep. <clears throat> Uh, to this day, he won't come near a church. So, you know, what I, can I say? Uh, the man went on to become a bishop. What can I say about that? Um, he knows his sheep from his kings, I guess. That's a good thing for bishops to know. In any event, um, <clears throat> the three things get run together, so you tune in and you hear all three things run together and you don't realize that there's a, there's a peculiar oddity to that, 
You know, it was a nice way to entertain the people in Gratio. Um, they loved it, you know. And it's the first crash, by the way, all right? There was no room in the inn, so to speak. There was no church big enough for all the people who wanted to hear St. Francis. Well, he wasn't a saint yet. It only took him a year after he died. The church saw a good thing, they're going to run with it. So they built cathedrals, you know, for the man of poverty. It's fascinating. In any event, Francis found a grotto, which is sort of a, an enormous cavern in the side of rock. And that's where the first Christmas crash occurred. And he had, you know, people dress up as angels and kings and all the rest of that stuff. Everybody loved it. The fact that no one, <laughs> the Matthean account, this is where I tell you, I'm, I'm the Grinch that stole Christmas because I'm going to tell you a few things you don't want to hear. The Matthean account has no relationship whatsoever to the Lucan account. <clears throat> the Jesus of Matthew is not the Jesus of Luke. They're not even distantly related. But that's because it's not a factual narrative. It's a theological narrative. All of the infancy narratives are what are called, by those of us who have nothing better to do with our lives than come up with fancy terms, um, <clears throat> redactions. Okay, what's a redaction? Well, <clears throat> I'll give you my, the most famous one. You know the story of Job, right? And Job's a good dude, and you know things start happening to him, and he gets increasingly annoyed. Um, and his friends say, you must have done something wrong. He says, I've not done anything wrong. He, he, you know, I go to the cathedral. How could I do anything wrong? And he, he just goes on and on and on. And his losses mount. And finally, you know, he, he has a showdown with God. And... <clears throat> He pretty late, blatantly lays it out that God's kind of missed the mark. And God, well, there are lots of versions about what God said. And my favorite is some people just annoy me. But um, <clears throat> the one that's recorded is, where were you when I created the world? Which is to say, you've got, <clears throat> you're a little bit big for your britches, bub. And that's where the story ended. I mean, it's a powerful story, and that's the end. Well, nobody likes a story that ends that way. You know, he, he's standing there in tatters, and the Lord has just blown him apart and said, you know, you're kind of annoyed me. Um, so you get a redactor, and they fix it. And what they do is they put a little addition in, and he gets everything back that he lost sevenfold. You know, it's great. And everybody loves the story, but it's not the story that was in the Bible to start with, which is interesting, which is what's happened to a lot of things. Um, I'll get in even more trouble. <clears throat> the end of Mark, you know, the women go to the temple. It's my favorite part of the Bible, um, which is routinely, I'm going to mess this up now. See, the problem with Italians is they talk with their hands. And they're not geared to have these electronic devices put around their ears. Okay, I think it's there. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the end of Mark, the women go to the tomb. Tomb's empty. They're terrified. They run away. And they say nothing to anyone. Chink, the end. That's hugely powerful. No, we got to fix that one. So they get appearances and everything else. That's a later edition. So that's what's called a redaction. That's by way of introduction to say that the stories that we call the infancy narratives are redactions. They were added later. They are not eyewitness accounts. Remember, I said that in one church, and a lady came rushing up to me, and she said, our pastor said that Luke had a, a witness, Paul, who recorded all this stuff. And I said, oh dear. I said, oh dear. I'm in trouble here. So I said, your pastor must have access to documents that I've not yet seen. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hmm.
This thing's gonna be a death of me. Okay, got it. You can hear me? Okay. So the emphasis of narratives are redactions. And the point is they make a theological um, <clears throat> resonance or tonal tonality set. So when you read the Lucan account, the emphasis falls on the syllable of the poverty of the manger, right? But when you go to Matthew, it's about, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> This dude is a descendant of David and all the kings in the universe, they're not really kings, they're magi, um, but they assemble to acknowledge him and he is a great threat to the state. So the three men, wise men go in different distances. Okay, that's a theological point. What kind of king is this newborn baby? And that's a different question than notice that the baby was born in a manger. Luther said the most important part of the gospel of Luke is that it points out that God shows up only in impossible places. That's really rather beautiful. Who would imagine that the king of the universe, the ruler of all things that are made and seen and unseen would appear in a manger, in donkey dung, and oxen. And of course, Luther loved to talk about donkey dung. I'm not inventing that, he actually said that. He, he kind of liked the earthy stuff. But it, his point was, you find God where you don't expect to. So that's the, the feature of the infancy narratives. And when you run them all together, everything has changed, which is what the Franciscan narrative does and what the King's College version does. And we get them separated, and, and next week, by the time I'm done with this, the good part will start, and that will be the procession of <coughs> carols and lessons on Advent Sunday, which is what Milner White called the service when he invented it in 1934. That was after his invention in 1918 <coughs> of the service of lessons and carols. <coughs> Excuse me. And he, he, he invented the second one because he said people are sort of missing the point. They're running around celebrating all the time and there's preparation for the celebration, which is basic. Now I got a lesson in that. I was saying to someone earlier, they looked at me and said, oh, you're, you're in the boot. And I said, yes. I, I went to my <clears throat> orthopedist this week, gleeful. I thought, okay, we're done with this thing. And he said, this is the season of expectation. <laughs> Expect to see it gone in about two months. <laughs> so I'm practicing Advent as I humble around, oh, okay. The third influence, which we're going to talk about today, is the one you don't know about. But in lots of ways, it's the most intriguing. Um, it's the Truro account. Now, in 1880, October 11, 15th, 1880, this church, St. Mary's, was torn down in preparation for what would become a grand cathedral. And in the meantime, they put up a shed. This is a very glorified picture of what the shed was looked like. Um, <clears throat> it, it's been two weeks since we broke ground out here, and if you notice, not a bloody thing has happened. Well, they had, they had sort of a problem back then because an October teardown date and a Christmas you know, get-together place doesn't work on the same schedule these guys are on in any event. But their schedules weren't much better, and so what they came up with was you know, a shed. So the setting for the service is a cold, and there's no heat, dark, just a few candles, dank, kind of stinky, 
impoverished thing, not like this, not like King's Chapel with all of its magnificence, but just dark. And moreover, there was a brand new bishop who's just come to town. Um, he's the first bishop of Truro. His name <clears throat> is Edward White Benson. And he grew up in Birmingham, so he knew about poverty. His family was very poor. And then his father died when he, um, <clears throat> Benson was eight. So he went to work and he supported his brothers and his mother until he got of age to go to school. That's pretty impressive. He knew what poverty was about, about eking together things. So when he hits town, they're pretty unhappy because the cathedral's been torn down but also a lot of their homes. So they're doing what people frequently do when they're unhappy. They have a libation or two <laughs> or 10 or 12, uh, which was the habit of going to the tavern, which you may have heard about. The Brits love to go to the tavern. Okay? So that's where they went instead of church. And they would sing raucously. And so Benson hits upon the idea with a little help from his sesenter. Now, what on earth is a sesenter? A sesenter is a person who is in charge of setting music and liturgy. Um, it's, it's one kind of priest, but it's sort of a special role. Anyway, there was this man by the name of Somerset Walpole. Actually, his whole name was George Henry Somerset Walpole. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> he was the Truro Center. And he suggested to Benson, you know, we, we could try some of those songs in, in church. And Benson says, what? He said, no, 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 we, we could try, we, we, we would fix them up a little bit, but we could try. So Benson says, oh, okay. So you're all used to seeing Christmas carols in church. This was the first time Christmas carols ever made it into church. So that makes it a very special service. And it worked. 400 people showed up in this tiny shed. You know, I sang somewhat typically along with the elements, but they'd already had a few elements before they got there. <laughs> so they had this remarkable service which Benson put together. And it's, it, it, it's an invention, but it's an invention by sort of taking a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and putting it together. There was a practice during the Middle Ages of nine services, or lessons rather, in a service. So he, he, he well, actually, there were nine services with nine lessons. The Middle Ages, that's all they did was go to church because there wasn't anything else to do. Um, or, you know, except raid towns and, you know, knock over windmills. But <clears throat> the main point was these things were available in the Middle Ages. So Benson is pretty well read. And he goes and he takes a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But he weaves together the services. Now, what, what's interesting, you know, I, he's, this is such a great service. It's too bad we, we don't know about it. The first thing is <clears throat> the greatest number of lessons come from the Hebrew Bible. Okay, there are nine lessons, six, excuse me, Six cover the Hebrew Bible. That's fascinating. That's fascinating because he puts it all in the sense of we're going to talk about what to expect. So you have, um, of course, the Genesis account, you know, how we all got in the mess we're in. That's one version of how we got in the mess we're in. Okay. <clears throat> but then he draws on numbers. I see him but not now, I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the sons of Sheth. Okay, so there's this whole idea of the star of Jacob. 
This is the fun part of this. That's what Giotto, I told you about Giotto last week, who's the first Renaissance humanist painter. He makes figures really come alive. I'll give you, okay, here you go. There he is again, that's Giotto. And that's very different from the Byzantine figures who were very um, petrified. That's a good way to put it. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting page drawn from um, a Bible. It's a um, <clears throat> Middle Eve, Middle, medieval manuscript. And <clears throat> it is Micah 5.2. Now, you've never heard of Micah 5.2, but it talks about a star in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one. So Benson picks that one up. So you've got this whole sense of, and there's a long history of waiting for the one to come. That's what Advent is. And this is a service about waiting. And what, what's going to happen is we're going to get to, <clears throat> of course, Isaiah, which is <clears throat> out of, you know, the people who walked in darkness are seeing the great light. Rembrandt always likes to fix things up. So you can't possibly miss the fact that we're going to see great light here because they are flooded with light in the front and they are walking out of darkness. Okay, now where is this headed? Well, where it's headed is to the Annunciation. The Truro service is very interested in the Annunciation, but not only the Annunciation to Mary, but also the Annunciation to Elizabeth. And then you remember Elizabeth and Mary visit one another. And then you may also recall that, <clears throat> okay, here we have the visitation. So <clears throat> what we have, and here's another visitation. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is Zechariah is being told that Elizabeth's going to give birth. Now, in the version that is put together by Rembrandt, Zechariah is blind. Rembrandt loved to make the people who were the centerpiece, like the prodigal son, the father is blind. Or Simeon, who is saying all sorts of things about what will happen with Jesus at the temple, blind. So Rembrandt wants to focus on a different kind of seeing. It's only possible if you, you move away from the visual. Okay. So this is a vi the visitation by Dudo Vognadina. And the angel visits Mary. And now the Book of Hours has the visitation between the two. And what's important about that, to be perfectly blunt, is that you get Elizabeth and Mary, but they're part of a longer tradition, starting with Sarah. You remember Sarah. The Lord says to Sarah, you're going to have a child. And she goes outside the tent, and she laughs up a storm. She said, you don't know, Abe. You know, that boy ain't going to get that job done. No. <laughs> the Lord says, mm-hmm. <laughs> but the Hebrew Bible's filled with Hagar and Sarah and a whole series of women who are barren, and then they give birth. And the Lord moves in mysterious ways. See? <laughs> this is going to be the death. Oh, thank heavens. Someone's here to rescue me. Or just, yeah, we're going to try this. I mean, if it falls off one more time, we'll go to a handheld. But OK. I'll just stop talking with my right hand. You know, just, OK, we're going to swing around with the left hand. 
So he puts the enunciation, this is really interesting, to me at least, but I think it should be interesting here, puts the enunciation squarely in the tradition of the legacy of the barren women, which is to say the legacy of the impossible possibility. So you have both Elizabeth, I mean, who had the same response to Zechariah, by the way, that Sarah had to Abe, you know. <laughs> you have been around. <laughs> mm-mm, mm-mm, that's not going to happen. And <clears throat> same thing happens. But by putting them in that tradition, what gets lifted up is the extraordinary incomprehensibility of what's going to happen. And so you can't say in Advent, think about it, what's going to happen? That's what's so special about this service that happens next week. When the choir processes, it stops. And it processes a little bit, stops again. And it processes some more. There is no certain end toward which they are moving. They don't know yet. The event has not yet occurred. This is really important. So it's about an aspect of faith that we don't like. It's called waiting and longing. All right. I told you about Rembrandt. Here it is. Um, And so you, you move all the way through. Now, what is remarkable just unbelievable is that, of course, you get the prologue. But then Benson adds two readings from the letters. Galatians 3, the children of God through faith are made heirs of the promise. They become children of God. This is the El Greco sharing of Christ's robe. And in Galatians is followed by the 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. So the point of the Annunciation is that we are going to become children of God. The point of the Annunciation is not a baby in a manger. It's a transformation of us. That's why we wait, so that we might hear how we are going to be transformed. And the transformation is then symbolized by the child, but the earliest practices didn't have a child. Nobody was there. That's one of the constructions that we have. So here we go again. with a manuscript illustration of one John on being made the children of God. And it's in uh, the Morgan Bible at uh, the Morgan Museum, the Majewski Bible. It's a beautiful thing. There's great celebration. We've got coming the children of God. That's a very different emphasis. I call it the Annunciation emphasis. So we have the Franciscan emphasis. Remember the sheep season, the goat season, the camel season, the wise men and the angels, you know, and the shepherds. Okay, the one that we know best. That's one scene. Then we have the <clears throat> Annunciation scene which is the history, the tradition of the impossible possibility, barren women suddenly having children. That was the great symbol of the impossible possibility in the Hebrew Bible. It's repeated again and again. So now we're talking about a, a, a subtext, which will stand out, the power of women to be present to the impossible possibility. In every representation of this, men are in the background. Zechariah is blind. 
when the angel comes, he covers his face. He doesn't, you know, this is too much. But you have this incredible emphasis upon the courage of women to be, stand forth in the face of God and to have the courage to stand forth in the face of God. Lest we be confused about that, um, I remind you of Isaiah, Isaiah 6, which says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I went up and I beheld the Lord, and in front of him was a seraphim with two wings above and two wings below and two wings the center, and I was terrified. And the seraphim picked up a coal that was burning and put it on my tongue that I might be purged of my bad words. This makes McDonald's coffee sound like a treat, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> and then he says, <clears throat> who will go out in my name? Now, I know that historically speaking, Methodists are derivative from Episcopalians, Anglicans, to be perfectly honest. They're stepchildren. But there were a few errant stepchildren before the divorce, okay? Because Isaiah says what no Episcopalian would ever say, which is, oh, I'll go do it, you see. <laughs> An Episcopalian would say, Let, let's talk about this for a while, you know? <laughs> I want to get a good picture. No, 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 no. Isaiah's out. I'll do it. And then Isaiah has a second thought. He says, by the way, you know, um, will they understand what I'm talking about? And the Lord says, no. He says, okay, I'll do it. Now we're clear he's not Episcopalian. All right. <laughs> and he says, how long? And the Lord says, until the end of time. No one will understand this until the end of time. Now that's what it means to stand in the presence of the holiness of God. We've kind of, you know, made it holy, 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 nice, 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 fuzzy, wuzzy, you know, couldn't, wouldn't, etc. But for this tradition, the tradition there is the courage of the women to step into an impossible place and the terror of that and to be leaders and showing the people what faith is and being instruments through which that faith of God toward us becomes evident. So that's the Annunciation tradition. And through that, we become children of God. So you have the Annunciation tradition, and you have <clears throat> the Franciscan tradition, and you have very different emphases. And then you have the third, which tries to separate the Advent piece from the Christmas piece, which Benson, in essence, does, except that he has, as a fourth reading, by the way, or, oh, sorry, the seventh reading, is the, gospel, the prologue to the Gospel of John. Now, the service that we know, that's how it ends. You know, this is the complete fulfillment of it. No, 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 no. Benson says it's not. And he adds Galatians and 1 John. The end is not in the beginning of the word. The end is we become children of God. That's extraordinary. Benson was an enormously talented man. He went on, you don't know this, but he went on to become the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's highly esteemed. <coughs> um, he continued to invent services. He had a wonderful, wonderful theological sensibility, and he was um, instrumental um, in peacekeeping. I don't know if you know this, but Anglicans are a little disputatious. They, they, they sometimes forget the middle way and they want to come down on one side or the other side and be right. And, you know, sometimes we do it called the continental divide. So the Africans want to do one thing and the Americans want to do another thing. So <clears throat> various archbishops of Canterbury 
have had as one of their singular foci, foci um, healing divisions within the communion. Now the point of the service was he saw this as a healing moment within the life of the church, that we should remember that it become, we become children of God. And it was offered to people who were in desperate poverty, who were deeply saddened by the loss of their homes and the church that they had loved, but it was being torn down to build a, an elegant cathedral. So the setting's entirely different. So that will be what I focus on next week. I'm gonna take a few minutes now to ask questions. Um, <clears throat> We don't have George running around with microphones today, so you have to stand up and you know holler. Um, <clears throat> oh, do, do, are, are you, some do you have a? Oh, you're going to run to the microphone. Okay, we have a microphone substitute, so somebody will come and answer your, let you ask whatever questions. Is there a biography of Benson? I'll bet you there is. I need to find it. I, I know that there is a history of Truro Cathedral where I got a lot of it, and then there are articles all over the place, and I keep running into more and more things. So I've been sort of compiling a history about Benson. Um, but it's a good question. I'm, I'm sure a person who's had that kind of accomplishment has a biography. I just... You know, I came in through the back door. I didn't know about Benson when I started this project. I just sort of wondered. You see, the interesting thing about this that I should probably make it my concluding remark for today is that this, these services of lessons and carols are imitative of the great vigil of Easter. You see, and which is much older. And I may be here to tell you about that in the spring. But... Um, <clears throat> that's what George tells me. So, I mean, if George says it, it's probably going to happen. But that's way older. That goes back to the third century. This is really recent stuff, 1880. But it's imitative. It does the same thing. It it, it's a telling of holy history. And the emphasis falls on the syllable of holy history, not... You know, it's a narrative history about God's mighty deeds in history. It is not um, a chronological history. So frequently the events are put together in a way that's not even remotely chronological, or it's more thematic. Okay, are there other questions? I just found there are two biographies. Oh, great. That are good for download. If you look up Archbishop Benson, okay, it'll great. come up on your, Thank you. on your Google. All right, well, now that's a word I don't know about. See, that, that happened after I re, you know, stopped being with the brontosaurus. <laughs> yes? What was the public reaction to the building of such a grand cathedral in Truro um, since it was an area that was filled with poverty and the, the cathedral is just glorious. I mean, it's... Oh, it's spectacular. Really just something amazing. It's neo-Gothic. Mm -hmm. um, it, after it happened, it took forever and a day to get it done. Um, and it took a lot of royal money to make it happen. But after it did, the town felt um, a great deal of joy about it because it brought employment and it brought um, attention. And it was in a time when the centrality of the church still mattered. Uh, if you go to Truro today, it is as empty as a lot of the churches on Fifth Avenue in New York. Other questions? I've been incredibly clear. Thank you. <laughs> oh, 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 good. Thank heaven somebody's going to deliver me from that particular illusion. Yes. So you said that a lot of the churches on Fifth Avenue are empty. Yeah. What do you think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take to bring them, people back? My deepest view 
about that is it's not about saving churches, it's about restoring faith. That when churches stop talking about church and start talking about faith, people will come back again. People got tired of mortgages, they got tired of development programs, they got tired of <clears throat> uh, a preoccupation with the maintenance of the buildings and less and less concern about faith. And this has been true across the country. And it happened in Europe. Um, the problem with building an empire is you have to maintain it. And after a while, you know, and this is what Constantine discovered. I mean, the fascinating thing was Christianity was a very different kind of religious experience before Constantine started its way toward becoming the religion of the state. It became a religion of the state not in 325, the way we think, but in 379 with the decrees of Theodosius, and then it was Nicene Christianity and every other form, meaning Arians, were barred. Um, I believed that until I went to the Middle East, and guess what, there are Arians all over the place. You know, they didn't die, they just, you know, they were not put into the program. So then the problem became how do, and, and Damasus, who was the Pope, sold Theodosius, the emperor, on the idea of you can get a great infrastructure if you get one religion and everybody's working the project of the empire. So at that point, you stop having a, a kind of consciousness about um, <clears throat> a different perception of the world that Jesus had, and you start becoming a citizen of an empire. And so gradually, people stop being interested in being citizens of an empire. And one of the great examples of that is a little book by John Putnam entitled Bowling Alone. And his point, which was written about 25 years ago, he's a very interesting guy. And he, he laments the fact that nobody caught on to what he was talking about. It's essentially, in the old days, days that a number of us remember, people joined bowling leagues, or the Lions Club, or Kiwanis, or the church. This was all a metaphor for church for Putnam. Um, to be part of a community. But increasingly with individualism, people started bowling alone. Now you go to a bowling, if you go, there are all kinds of individuals playing, but there, there aren't leagues anymore. So you have a certain dissolution of society. So at a certain point, I gather, people will be drawn toward participating in a community around issues of faith, you know, how are we oriented in the world and what are the values around around buildings? I think the, the, the real struggle has been, you know, building campaigns and, and all the apparatus. And it, it's not a fault, it's just um, the underlying weight fell on building beautiful buildings like this one. It's an extraordinary, exquisite building. We're adding a new part, it's actually exquisite. But we have the good fortune here of a leadership that's very clear that ma what matters is not the building, what matters is the faith. So as Sam said, you know, um, faith is not partisan. Christian identity is not partisan, it's its own identity. Christian faith doesn't belong to a club. Christian faith is a way of being in the world. And as George would say, it's a way of being in the world that celebrates not compliance, but transformative love. And now I need to get you off to church. Thanks very much. See you next week. Thank you.